Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 133, Dr. Jeffrey Kopersky on 10 Science and Religion Myths, Part 1. As an undergraduate, Dr. Jeffrey Kopersky studied electrical engineering, but he went on to earn an MA and a PhD in philosophy from The Ohio State University. He's been a professor at Saginaw Valley State University in Michigan since 1997. A specialist in philosophy of science and philosophy of religion, he's published articles in many professional journals, including Philosophy of Science, the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science, Zygon, and the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. But he's here with us today to talk about some of the themes discussed in his 2015 book entitled The Physics of Theism, God, Physics, and the Philosophy of Science. Dr. Kopersky, welcome to the Trinity's Podcast. Thanks, Dale. I'm a big fan of the podcast, so it's an honor to be here. Really glad to have you. I really enjoyed reading the book, and it brought back memories of the couple of philosophy of science classes I had in my education. As I was reading it, I said to myself, wow, there is no filler material here. This is all meat. <laughs> it's not an Oscar Mayer wiener. Well, I don't know if they have filler material, but I think maybe <laughs> it's this is this is all steak. It, it took me a while to read, and every chapter was going into something else, really heavy and really interesting. Each chapter is almost kind of like a mini book. Yeah, the chapters are largely independent of one another. It's true. I really appreciated your kind of sober and independent judgment. It's not a politically correct book. Not that it's being offensive or anything, but you're not telling the anti-religion crowd what they want to hear. But you're not telling the Christian apologetics crowd what they want to hear. You're just hitting us with some serious philosophy of science. Of course, you're a Christian and believe in God, but you're after the truth of the matter. And if it's convenient or inconvenient, that's kind of what you're striving for. So I just wanted to start off by saying I really appreciate that about the book. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. Just trying to do some good philosophy of science here on topics that could use some good analysis. And yeah. Some camps will find parts of the book more to their liking than others. Everyone out there will find something uh, that they're not completely happy about, and I guess that's okay. I love the proverb that says, the wounds of a friend are better than the kisses of an enemy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there, there are so many things in this book I could talk to you about for hours. The nature of time, how to interpret quantum mechanics, free will, meta-theoretic shaping principles, the intelligent design movement how to understand miracles. But instead of doing 10 interviews, you and I together came up with a list of 10 science and religion myths, all of which are discussed in various ways in various chapters in your book. So I hope these will give people an idea what the book is about and even help them to see the value of philosophy of science. I would suppose that a lot of people haven't even heard of philosophy of science. I mean, why isn't just science enough? Sure, that's probably the case. There's lots of areas of specialization within philosophy that yeah, no one, unless you are a philosopher, unless you bumped up against it as an undergraduate, then yeah, you just don't know that they're even out there. You will see scientists in documentaries, in books, or just opinionating on some show. You'll see them talking about things that aren't science, like ethics or mm -hmm. religious belief or some cultural or political issue. And then you kind of realize that they might have the lab coat on, but they're actually not talking within their own sphere of expertise. That's right. And yet there's such a prestige with it that people want to know what you think about these things. Right. And I think that's fine. It's just that you do have to realize that when scientists are talking outside of the domain of their expertise, that they're no longer experts on, on those topics. And that's fine. I, I would like to know what their opinions are and if they have anything in the sciences that, that can help uh, you know, us to understand you know, other areas. In many ways, that's what philosophers of science do. It's really very interdisciplinary. We're trained philosophers, first and foremost, but then we're almost all of us are, are looking at some particular area of science. We specialize often in philosophy of physics or philosophy of chemistry, philosophy of biology. And so we want to know what the scientists are saying and then try to build some bridges between those two. 
When scientists try to do that, well, they're standing on one side of the bridge. They have a lot of expertise on one side. And sometimes what they say and what they think of applications of just the science, a philosopher will say, well, actually, logically here, there, there are some pretty big gaps, some pretty big uh, leaps from the science to, to some sort of conclusion. And then we want to ask some more questions about, you know, can we, can we fill in those gaps? And maybe sometimes you can't. And the conclusions just don't follow. One thing I appreciated about philosophy of science when I took some courses in it years ago is that philosophers of science look at science from a big historical perspective. And I think that really changes kind of how you relate to current day science. Yeah, certainly uh, for the last 50 years or so, we, we've thought that you can't just look at modern science, but to understand science and certainly changes in science, then history is going to be very important. There's been a lot, obviously, that's changed in the textbooks, but then also principles that have to do with what makes something good science. And I'll talk about that probably later on here in the interview. But yeah, you really can't understand the big picture without uh, going back in history, at least to some degree. And that's another thing that working scientists, for the most part, don't do a lot of. When you're in graduate school as a scientist, you have an anecdote here and there about the history, but it's generally not something that you study in any you know, particular way in any particular class. So yeah, philosophers um, tend to know something not only about current science, but think that the history is, is going to be important as well. Let's just jump right into our first five of our 10 science and religion myths. Number 10 is the Big Bang has taken the place of God. Big Bang theory shows us where the cosmos came from. That's a common view, but since we were talking about history, I, if you look at the not too far back history, just the you know 20th century, what you just said there is really contrary to the facts. A lot of Christian thinkers in the 30s and 40s were really very excited about Big Bang cosmology. One of the big fans would have been uh, Pope Pius XII. He, he thought it was great, mainly because he thought it confirmed something like uh, creation ex nihilo. So even people on both sides, one astronomer said that it's as if scientists had been clawing their way up Mount Truth for centuries, uh, only to find a bunch of theologians sitting up there. That's what the Big Bang you know, did for us. So a lot of theists, they thought the Big Bang was just great. A lot of atheists, not all of them, but a lot of them hated the Big Bang. Physicist Fred Hoyle, who actually coined the term Big Bang, when he did so, he was making fun of the idea. The way he would put it would be something like, you know, it's as if the universe started with a, the Big Bang or something. Ha, ha, ha. So it was, it was a pejorative term. He explicitly said that the whole idea was really just a form of, of religious fundamentalism. Now, of course, the evidence is so overwhelming that you don't hear that sort of talk anymore. There's still a problem. If there's a problem out there that physicists still have with the Big Bang, it's that it's ugly. It's, it's a singularity, which means that the laws of physics break down at that point. So physicists would prefer to have models where their laws cover and explain everything rather than breaking down at some arbitrary point. So there are a lot of ideas floating around out there. There's not a lot of evidence to support one or the other, but that doesn't stop people like Lawrence Krauss, cosmologist, from saying that physics has explained the Big Bang. Uh, and his answer is that the universe literally came from nothing. That's the title of his book, A Universe from Nothing. He claims to have answered this, this long-standing philosophical question about why is there something rather than just nothing at all. And to answer that, you have to have some sort of explanation for where the Big Bang came from. And he just says, well, it, it came from nothing. Now, a lot of philosophers of physics, both theists and atheists, think that's just wrong. Because it turns out, on further investigation, Krauss's nothing contains fields that change over time. Well, if there's a physical thing there, like a, like a field, and that thing changes over time, that's not nothing. So it looks like Krauss is just playing word games here. And there was a lot of back and forth about this whole thing. Most of it wasn't very nice. 
Krauss in particular didn't like it when a philosopher called him out on these things in the New York Times review of books. But in the end, I think it was actually a pretty good example of how science and philosophy and religion interact with one another, because Krauss has some interesting things to say. They're worth knowing. I like the book in many ways, except when he launched into these overly ambitious conclusions then. And that's where philosophy and, and to some degree theology push back on him. In the end, he did pull back and did clarify. And, and so we all learned something. Now, historically, before the 20th century, a lot of non-theistic philosophers prefer the view that the history of the universe should just go infinitely back, because then it wouldn't seem to need any cause to get it going, or they just couldn't see how time could ever begin. Right. That's a simpler view. There's no singularity, right? There's no particular instant that's unique that is a beginning. If it's like negative numbers, it just goes back forever and ever. That's a more elegant view in a lot of people's opinion. When the Big Bang Theory was first formulated, a knee-jerk reaction on the part of many was, hey, but this sounds like creation from nothing. I mean, yes. come on, we can't have this. Exactly. Just briefly, what was the evidence that has made Big Bang Theory so popular in recent times? Actual observations that distant bodies and, and other galaxies and the like actually are moving away from us. Everything at a very large scale actually does seem to be, be moving away from us. That would be the absolute main one. Even Einstein's field equations for general relativity, Einstein himself didn't like this originally, but they did seem to show that the universe shouldn't be stable. It either should be contracting or expanding. That didn't fit in very well with Einstein's own philosophical views. So he actually put in a new term into the equations to keep everything completely static. Again, later, Hubble came along and seemed to show that, uh, no, actually, the whole thing's expanding. And, and Einstein later then said that putting in this extra term was his biggest mistake. He should have just went with what the equations had said, you know, and the, what they said was right. We live in an expanding universe. So if we see that things are expanding further now, then mentally we rewind the process, and then it all just converges on a point, basically, a finite time ago. It can, Yeah. That depends somewhat on the exact geometry of space-time, whether it's going to contract to an individual point, but it certainly is going to go back to a point where the equations break down, where the, uh, there are the variables uh, actually shoot off to infinity, but it doesn't look like at that point that there is anything like space or time. So Big Bang Theory is describing the early history of the evolution of the cosmos. Is that a good way to put it? How things were... In the, in the initial moments? How things were and then you know, how, thing, how things are evolving right now. It isn't just the beginning. It's part of a, you know, an entire cosmology where the Big Bang event is the thing that starts it off. It's a complete model that it would continue on through to today. So the bang isn't a thing outside the cosmos that could be a source of it, that could be kind of a God replacement in one's thinking. It's really a breakdown. It isn't a point. There isn't some, you know, in, in the grand map of the cosmos, uh, there isn't some point that really is the Big Bang. It's just that when you rewind the tape, as you put it, eventually you're going to come to a place where the equations just break down. They all seem to be converging, 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 but then they just kind of stop. They, they stop making sense. They blow up. That's a singularity. We don't quite know what to say. And so we labeled that breakdown the Big Bang. Myth number nine is, as long as there's been science, there's been a war between science and religion. Yeah, that's a very popular view in some circles. And that plays very nicely into the kind of us versus them narrative that the press likes. That's not a scholarly opinion. Most historians of science, most historians of religion today will tell you actually that you can't make sense of the scientific revolution without theism. So let me just give you one really clear example. Just take the idea that there are laws of nature. That's obviously you know, very important to science. Um, where, mm -hmm. where did that idea come from? Where do you get laws? Because you know, if you go back into the ancient Greece, if you look in the medieval period, those folks, they didn't believe in natural law. 
Aristotle believed in an orderly reality, right? But he would have explained it in terms of, you know, the essences, the internal essences of things. Rocks fall straight down because that's what their essence dictates. And fire goes up because that's just what it does by nature. So order, for someone like Aristotle, it's going to be found in, in essences, natures, substantial forms. But you, you don't find laws in there. There's nothing about law. Because law, in Greek thought, that's what we do. That's what people do. That's what governments do. So nature is one realm, and then government's this completely you know, different sort of thing. So for them, the idea of natural law, that was actually something of an, of an oxymoron. You're taking two things that don't go together. Go forward now to something like the 17th century Europe, the scientific revolution, and now most European thinkers, so people we now call scientists, they would have called themselves natural philosophers, but you know, we'll, we'll just let that pass. They were theists. They believed that God had created and designed the universe, and he did so by using mathematical laws. So uh, the principles in Newton's Principia Mathematica, that's what they are. They are the laws of nature. The picture is that just as kings proclaim the laws for their country, well, God is kind of like you know, the overriding king, and he has proclaimed the laws of nature. And actually, this is just one story. It's, it's really surprising how much of we think of as modern science has roots in theism. So even things like empiricism and experimentation, people like Newton and Boyle and really pretty much every other big name you could think of at the time, they all believed that God had lots of choices to make in creation. So we didn't have to have these laws of nature. He could have you know, done something completely different. And God had lots of choices about what specific mechanisms to use to get things to turn out the way he wants. And the only way to actually discover what those choices were, what choices did God make, was to go out and look. You actually had to go out and see what nature was like. You had to do experiments. So you, you couldn't just sit around in a room trying to discern the essence of things. The only way to understand God's creation was something like reverse engineering. You start with the end products and then try to figure out how they were designed. So even empiricism itself originally has a theological basis. And this isn't just con conjecture on my part. I mean, people like, say, um, mathematician Roger Coates, he wrote the preface to uh, Newton's Principia. He just says it explicitly. The only way to find out what God did, what choices he made, is to go out and investigate. These same folks also thought that God had given us uh, reason, accurate senses, so that we could do this sort of investigation and actually get at the right answers. So there were religious reasons for thinking that we could get the right answers in science. There's more stories just along those lines. The stereotype that science is in some way like an, an angry reaction to religion, it's just false. The uniformity of nature, Occam's razor, conservation laws, on and on, they all were originally accepted for theological reasons. And this is why people like Kepler would have said that really what science is, is just thinking God's thoughts after him, because he was the designer and the creator, and he used laws of nature. The whole warfare idea that you mentioned, that came much later. That's people like John W. Draper, Andrew Dixon White, and people who were trying to drive a wedge between reason and science on one hand, and then superstition, emotionally crippled people, that's over here. So smart people over here, you know, not so smart people over here, and now you get to choose. Who do you want to be with? <laughs> so that's, right. you know, it's a rhetorical move. Do you want to hang out with the dummies and the scaredy cats? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you choose. It's up to you. Do whatever you want. Well, I, yeah, I guess dummies and scaredy cats doesn't sound that good. So no, no, not so good. I got to be on the anti-faith side, on the science side. There you go. So <laughs> and this is this is really the kind of thing that drives philosophers crazy because there wasn't any scholarship involved. It's it's not about getting at the truth. It's really about rhetorical advantage. Even the stuff about ancient peoples believing the earth was flat and then Columbus coming along to prove otherwise that was all invented at the same time. It's, it's all fiction. Aristosthenes showed that the earth was round 200 years before the first Roman emperor. Every educated person in the Middle Ages knew that the earth was round. The flat earth myth, that's just, again, part of this invention to, to help support the warfare model. Again, historians know all this, but it just never seems to filter down to the high schools. Every semester I ask my students, you know, give me something a thousand years ago everybody believed, but, you know, wasn't the case. And you know, I always get the flat earth and Columbus and all that. It's all a kind of a urban legend trying to do this wedge driving. Smart people over here, stupid people over here.
There's quite an interesting history of philosophical developments from ancient times up to medieval times. There's some really interesting quotations in your book from these early modern era scientists who believe in God. I found that really interesting. And if people want to know, well, who are these people that think they can sit in an armchair and just intuit how (laughs) nature works? Well, have you ever heard of Plato and Aristotle (laughs) and everybody influenced by them? (laughs) They're not small names. They're not insignificant figures. That's right. (laughs) Yeah. And, I mean, you get people like, you know, the very talented and smart, but sometimes weird Christian philosopher Origen, you know, coming out with stuff like this, which is from the Platonic training that he had. He says, the most perfect shape is a sphere. And so, therefore, after the resurrection, human bodies will be spherical. Sure. Yeah, we're all rolling around like billiard balls now. Like, he's, it's not a joke. This was natural (laughs) philosophy back then. That's right. You know... They were doing the best they could with what they had. They didn't have what we think of as modern science. Really, the the state of the art was Greek philosophy. And so, yes, Greek ideas about perfection and lots of other things, they were trying to show how theology could square with that. That pushed them then into some some odd circles. But I have some sympathy because that just was the knowledge they had, or at least the best picture they had to deal with at the time. But yeah, in modern eyes, you know, going back and reading that, that does seem to be very odd. And it's not like it was totally unconnected from observation either. You know, Aristotle personally dissected a whole bunch of animals to try to figure out what all the parts did. And and he didn't always guess right, but, Mm -hmm. you know, he didn't have the tools that we have. Mm -hmm. But you're right. You have to respect them given what they knew at the time. But some of it looks pretty silly. You kind of kind of wonder what will look silly 200 years from now. That makes a lot of philosophers, many of us in, in philosophy of science, are, are realists about science, meaning we tend to think that advanced science, mature science, gives us um, at least an approximately true picture of the way reality is. But anti-realists, skeptics, come back and say, well, look, if you, if you look over the, the history of scientific development, things tend to change pretty radically. And so something that was thought uh, you know, to be true 100 years ago, now we just kind of look back and you know, think it's kind of silly and it, we don't even, don't even talk about it anymore. So, so the pessimistic induction, as it's called, looking back over the, the history of science, makes you think in 100 years, you know, what will they look back on the things we think of today and, yeah, and, and think are, are silly and, and want to reject? So that should give um, an overconfident realist some pause because it's likely that yeah in 100 years and 200 years things are going to are going to turn around a bit people are going to look back on us and say oh yeah that's that's a little silly why did they think that i would suppose that most people don't realize that some very famous and influential philosophers of science are anti-realists in the sense that they think science is for helping us do things and solve practical problems and for giving an explanation for what we observe, but then they don't necessarily infer that reality is as our best theory says. That's right. So there are some, and they take themselves just to be good empiricists again. Uh, An empiricist is going to put a lot of weight on what we can actually see, what we can detect with our senses. But then once you get beyond that, uh, once you get into the unobservable, now things change quite a bit. Some are going to say, Boss von Frossen, uh, very famously, uh, would say that, yeah, when it comes to things we can, we can empirically detect and empirically verify, you should believe in those things. But once you get to theories that talk about unobservable entities, quarks, and, and things like that, well, you can use that stuff if it's useful, if it works, but you shouldn't literally believe that it's true. You shouldn't believe that it's true in the same way that I believe that my coffee mug here is, is sitting in front of me. I can see that. But if there's quirks bouncing around in there, well, that, you know, I can use it. I'll act as if it's true. But really, we shouldn't believe that it's literally the case. A lot of people, when they first get exposed to different forms of anti-realism, it sounds a little silly. My students come into class, and I think they're trained in some ways to think as realists, that what science is getting at is the real picture of how things, you know, are actual reality, observable and unobservable. But then once you start yeah, looking at some of the counter arguments, the realist position has some weaknesses. Every realist should be walking uh, carefully, I think. Can you tell us what phlogiston is? <laughs> I love phlogiston. <laughs> yes. So phlogiston, why do things burn? according to phlogiston theory. Which isn't a current theory. Which is not the current, so you cannot find this on the periodic table. So why do things burn? So we have a candle. Let's take a big candle. Why is it burning if it's burning? It's because it's got this stuff in it, phlogiston. 
for combustion to commence and to keep going, it's got to have phlogiston in it that it can give off. It'll stop burning once it, it has used up all its phlogiston. And there's a test. We can, we can test this theory. So take our candle and light it and then put it under a vase and then seal it off. Seal off the vase with tape so it, it, it's all you know, perfectly sealed. And of course, eventually, the candle's going to stop burning. Now, why did it stop burning? Well, because it's been giving off phlogiston, giving off phlogiston. Eventually, all of the air inside the vase becomes saturated with phlogiston. So the candle can't give off any more phlogiston. And if it can't do that, then combustion has to stop and, and, and the candle, candle snuffs itself out. So there, there's a perfectly good, empirically verifiable explanation based on phlogiston theory about why combustion happens and, and why it might stop. Right. And so now we just think this is just completely wrong. Just no such thing as phlogiston. Not even approximately true. That's right. It worked, but oxygen theory then displaced it. The same thing's true of caloric. We used to think that um, the reason the room I'm sitting in is warmer than you know, being outside in the parking lot is that my room has more the stuff, caloric, in it. That's where we get the word calorie from it. There is no caloric. We don't, we don't believe in that at all. And, and on and on. There's a n- number of examples just like this where you had a good theory. It seemed to work. It seemed to make good predictions. And yet, wasn't the case. Geocentrism, just the view that the Earth is the center of the universe. We look back on that you know, now. And again, it's very different from the, the flat Earth myth that I was talking about a little bit ago. A thousand years ago, it is the case that everybody thought the Earth was the center of the universe. And that's another thing that we laugh about. But look, if you were not told otherwise, you had not been taught otherwise, we just left it up to you. You know, go out and figure out what the truth is here. You absolutely would be a geocentrist. You absolutely would be. You and I would be both. We, we would think the Earth is the center of the universe because it looks that way. It's perfectly empirical, perfectly natural inference. It just happens to be false. <laughs> Well, speaking of geocentrism, that brings us to myth number eight, which is Galileo was clearly a martyr in the science and religion wars. Yeah, that is another, another popular one. Historian Ronald Numbers wrote a, wrote a book a few years ago that actually had the title, Galileo Goes to Jail and Other Myths About Science and Religion. I not only like the title, a lot, I highly recommend the book, but let's talk a little bit about the whole Galileo incident. If you're going to understand the story, I think first you have to note the, uh, the intellectual climate at the time. We're talking 1500s, right? So the New World was just beginning to be explored. The Renaissance had challenged all sorts of traditional views. And I think most importantly, the Protestant Reformation was in full swing. So there were a lot of political tensions, a lot of, a lot of theological tensions in Southern Europe at this time. And so in the midst of all this, uh, Copernicus finally allows the publication of his work in 1543. And actually, when it first came out, most people thought that the Copernican model wasn't literally true. It was just a, a computational device. So because they all thought, obviously, geocentrism is true, but this is a lot easier. You can get the right answers, you know, this way. But, you know, it's just, it's just a trick. It's just a computational device. It's not literally true. Now, Galileo, of course, thought otherwise. He thought that it wasn't just useful, that it actually was the case, that that heliocentrism is true. We're not the center of the universe. He actually then made several discoveries that undermine the the, the more traditional geocentric view. He he discovered uh, sunspots, and the sunspots, they, they came and they went. That didn't fit with the prevailing view that the heavens are perfect and unchanging. I think the most damaging thing he discovered was that Jupiter has its own moons. And so that proved that not everything is revolving around the Earth. I think all that, that's pretty well known. What isn't well known is that a lot of scholars liked Galileo's work just fine, especially the Jesuits. They liked Galileo. They thought his stuff was really good. His main opposition actually came from the Aristotelians who still controlled the universities. And that's because for them, geocentrism was an important part of their overall metaphysics. And so 
for them to give that up really called into question a whole bunch of other stuff. So they saw Copernicanism as a threat, and I think rightly so. But apart from them, you know, Galileo, he was, he was a well-respected scientist. At least that's true up until the point where Galileo started writing about theological matters. And it's then that people really started getting nervous because here you have this, this Catholic scientist who was starting to talk about matters of theology, matters of, of biblical interpretation, and they really weren't supposed to do that. That's the domain of the theologians and the clergy. And the main thing they were worried about was that Galileo seemed to be promoting views that fit a lot better with Protestantism than Catholicism. And so that caused something of a panic in some circles. So to make sure that things didn't go too far, the church just started laying down the law. And one of the things they said was, you could teach heliocentrism, you could teach the Copernican models, but again, only as, as a computational device. You, you couldn't teach it as true until there was proof. So. Galileo had evidence, but he didn't have proof. And so that actually kind of settled things for a while. But then Galileo made a, a political miscalculation. He published a book called The Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. And in this dialogue, you've got three characters. You've got a kind of old school Aristotelian. You've got a Copernican like Galileo. And then you've got this kind of in interested layman uh, who's listening to the whole thing. But instead of it being a, a balanced discussion of the arguments, uh, kind of back and forth, most people saw it, the whole book, as a kind of Copernican propaganda. And the thing that really got him in trouble was that in the book, he, he seemed to be making fun of Pope Urban VIII. Uh, <laughs> that, that's not good. Uh, if, you're, if you're a public figure, if you're a public Catholic figure in 17th century, yeah, that's it. Just yeah, you don't want to be making fun of the Pope. So, in retaliation, Galileo was found guilty of teaching heliocentrism without proof, and so he spent most of the remainder of his life confined to his villa outside of Florence. So, it is true that Galileo was condemned by the church, but historians don't see this as primarily a matter of science versus religion. Some people see it really mainly as a political dispute. Galileo was acting a little too independent, he was sounding a little too Protestant, and so the best way to kind of get a handle on that and put a stop to it was, was house arrest. I tend to side with, with John Headley Brooke. He argues that the real root of the conflict is old science versus new science. And this is something you see in, in, in every scientific revolution. So you've got those, those university Aristotelians, that's the old guard. They were not willing to just go quietly into the night which is really pretty typical in, in major shifts like this. The church mainly got itself into trouble because it, it just bet on the wrong horse. They sided with the old science over the new and then used their power to help enforce that bet. But I think that if the scientific old guard hadn't reacted so badly, and if really if Galileo hadn't been such a hothead himself, things would have turned out quite differently. This sort of old guard, new guard sort of thing, this is just the sort of thing that happens uh, in, in every scientific revolution. Now, of course, portraying the whole thing as science versus religion, that's a lot sexier, right? So I doubt that particular spin is going to go away any, anytime soon. But most scholars think that's really just misleading. That's not the prevailing narrative uh, according to the history. Myth number seven is religion is based on faith, whereas science is based solely on empirical observation. I'm not sure that I know what it means to say that religion is based on faith, because that word gets used in all sorts of ways today. So no doubt faith is important in religion. Um, I'm not denying that at all, but it's, it's not itself a way of knowing something. So even in the New Testament, the Greek word for faith, pistis, is roughly synonymous with trust. So in Greek thought, I mean, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't trust a person. You wouldn't have faith in them without some reason to do so. Faith wasn't the opposite of reason and evidence in Greek thought. Faith actually depended on, on reason and evidence. It, it wasn't, pistis was not a, a fundamentally religious notion. I think that any finite being has to have faith in this sense. 
I can't know with certainty that this chair is going to support my weight, but my past experience dictates that it will. And, and so I sit down, trusting, having faith that it won't collapse under me. I, I think scientists exercise that sort of faith all the time. There's really, really no avoiding it. Of course, you're giving a sensible definition of faith. Sometimes it's believing what you know ain't so, or yes. believing with no or against the evidence or with no evidence. That's right. So like I said, it gets, it gets used in, in all sorts of ways. A lot of time has gone past, right? So, I mean, it's, it's 2,000 years uh, since, since the Bible was written. But if you're a Christian and you're trying to figure out, well, when we read that word faith in the New Testament, you know, what does that mean? First and foremost, if, maybe this doesn't capture the, the whole of it, but the core is just trust. It's not a mystical notion. It's not even really a fundamentally religious notion. So, yeah, I think that is something that, again, any finite being has to have just to get around in the world. There's just no avoiding it. But when you're reading the words of Jesus in the Gospels or hearing somebody like Paul or Peter talk in their letters, they do talk about faith, but they also seem to be appealing to evidence. They talk about things that they've seen and heard. Exactly. They appeal to the character of Jesus' teaching or to miracles that they claim to have witnessed. Right. That's supposed to be evidence. That's my point. The reason you can have faith that Jesus' promises will be fulfilled and things like that is because you've got evidence, you've got reasons for believing it. You can trust in what Jesus has promised and what Jesus has taught because you have evidence that he really knew what he was talking about and that God favored him, principally by raising him from the dead. So I understand faith to not in any way be in, in, in conflict with, with reason and evidence. I think this, again, is, is the primary biblical understanding of faith. It, it actually, to some degree, relies on evidence and reason. But the thing about this myth is a lot of people are going to hear it and just think it's true by definition. Religion, by definition, is belief based on faith, and science is by definition based solely on empirical observation. Isn't that just obviously true? Well, how about science being based solely on empirical observation? Science is actually you know, far more complex than, than just observation. But yeah, there's data and observation. There are laws and theories. That's true. But the data don't entail any particular theory, certainly not in any sort of deductive way. If you're going to get from data to theory and then say judge good theories from bad theories, there's a whole other set of principles involved. And actually, you mentioned this before, meta-theoretic shaping principles. They're absolutely crucial for understanding how, how science works. Now, you're not going to find a list of these in any science textbook because for the most part, they're just taken as givens. This is, this is just the way things are. Mm -hmm. So, some of these I already mentioned. So things like today, we just, we just take it as, oh, of course, the universe is governed by a set of laws. Uh, and, and of course, the, the laws are, are uniform in nature, meaning that they're the same now as they always have been. And they're the same locally here on Earth as they are you know, on the far side of Andromeda, one set of laws. There's no theory that says that's the case or proves it to be the case. Good science presupposes this. Up until the discovery of quantum mechanics, there was a principle that said that a principle of continuity, every system evolves from one state to another in a kind of continuous fashion. There's no leaps from one state to another. And with some exceptions, as we already said, most scientists have been realists. They think that they are discovering truths about reality, that, that theories aren't just social constructions. Um, they're not merely useful. And then there's a whole set of, of methodological principles. So like the, the desire, the need for, for repeatable experiments, we think that's part of good science. Occam's razor, that, that one should favor simpler explanations over more complex explanations. Uh, and then there's a whole host of what philosophers call explanatory virtues, that we should prefer explanations that are empirically adequate, that are, that are testable, that, that fit well with what we already know. Even, even elegance is one of these virtues. Um, especially in physics, we tend to like mathematical elegance in our models. So my point is, is this, that none of these, none of these shaping principles, none of them are entailed by any scientific theory. You certainly can't derive them from observations. These are, these are philosophical principles that science relies on. You can't actually do science without them. Now, what most people don't realize is how many of these principles were originally justified on religious grounds. We've already talked about the laws of nature presupposing a divine law giver, but that uniformity of nature thing that I was talking about, that the laws are the same, that Newton inferred that from God's omnipresence. 
If God is the same everywhere, then Newton said so are his laws. Occam's razor and and appeals to simplicity. Those were originally rooted in the idea that God works in in the most perfect and and efficient way. And even that bit about scientific realism, originally that that was based on the idea that God had given us the ability to find the truth about physical reality. We can trust our theories because God's given us the ability to get the right answer. The short answer is that there's more to religion than faith. There is evidence involved. It's really important. And there's more to science than observation and theory. If that's all you had, you couldn't actually do science. So this big contrast is really kind of a comic book caricature that serves the purposes of certain polemicists, really. It's that wedge driving again. The smart people are the ones that are going to use going to use reason and, and you know empirical observation, and then those other folks they're going to rely on on faith because that's all they got. And so yeah, it's it's rhetorical, it's wedge driving, it's a caricature. It absolutely is. The mouth breathers and the knuckle draggers. <laughs> yes, that, there you go. <laughs> Don't want to be with them. So come on over with the smart people. <laughs> right. That's right. Myth number six is science is supremely open-minded, willing to drop all traditional assumptions upon the receipt of new data. You know, that would be true, except for the fact that science is actually done by people. And people generally aren't all that keen when it comes to repudiating their life's work just because some new information came along. This is partly a matter of psychology. It's partly a matter of pride. Really, historically, it just (laughs) scientific change is not easy. But there are also two more shaping principles that come into play here in terms of how open-minded scientists should be. So one of these is what Del Ratch calls tenacity. Scientific theories are not overthrown at the first sign of problems. Uh, A good theory kind of earns the right to weather some anomalies. So if you look at Newtonian mechanics, we didn't discard that just because a, a couple of the planets weren't behaving exactly like they should, according to Newton's theories. We didn't reject Darwinian evolution just because we didn't find as many transitional fossils as Darwin thought that we would. And we don't reject general relativity today just because the universe is expanding faster than it seems like it should. So good theories earn the right to see how things play out. And we think that's good because it makes new theories and new ideas prove themselves. Science doesn't just jump on the newest bandwagon just because it's new. And that's good because then it keeps us from latching on to half-baked ideas. It's a kind of king of the hill approach. Tenacity is kind of a a king of the hill view that there's a given theory that's, you know, taken to be the right answer right now. And it's got to be knocked off before we start rewriting the textbooks. And tenacity says that's a good thing. Now, there is a downside to this. There are cases where tenacity holds back progress in science. I think this is actually part of the story with Galileo. Heliocentrism, again, hadn't proved itself in Galileo's time. Tenacity then, you know, kept geocentrism in place, even though Galileo was right. There's lots of examples. It took about 50 years for plate tectonics to actually get a foothold in geology, even though it was the the right answer. And then the idea that dinosaur extinctions were caused by asteroid impacts, that didn't fare any better. Initially, paleontologists just hated that idea. So in these cases, tenacity, yeah, it held science back, but most of the time it seems to work. Not only are scientists not supremely open-minded, there's good reason to think that they shouldn't be. You don't want science to be chasing the latest fad. So in practice, it's intensely conservative, really. It's very reluctant to move off of what it considers to be a well-established theory, but that's not a bad thing. Right. However, it does involve people and institutions that aren't always rational or might be nationalistic. Oh, sure. Yeah, there's all sorts of reasons, sociological and psychological reasons for for not wanting. And, and some of it, I mean, just makes perfectly good sense. 
if, if you're a scientist and you've spent your whole career you know, pursuing one set of theories and this is what you've taught and and use these successfully and you know there's maybe some problems on the edges yeah but and then there's some, something completely new comes along that means that you know you spent your whole life <laughs> teaching and, and promoting something that was you know strictly speaking false Psychologically, that's a really hard thing to to do. This idea that that scientists will will just happily say, "Oh, good, I've been I've been shown the truth now, and so I will I will happily drop you know this thing that I believed my whole life and and embrace the new." That just psychologically, that just simply doesn't happen. Scientific revolutions are difficult. To some sense, what Tenasty says is is they should be the the new ideas shouldn't be embraced simply because they knew they're new they have to they have to prove themselves they have to earn a, a right to be at the table it seems like this type of conservatism though shouldn't even be limited to science that if you have a core belief that you're very convinced about and you come up with some counter evidence to it it seems like you should be resistant that seems yep. like the rational thing to do in general that's right. This isn't just a principle that you find in the philosophy of science. Uh, you know, epistemologists also think this, 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 is, this is true for, for belief in general, that if something has worked, you have a reliable set of beliefs, then just because some sort of new data comes in, new information comes in that doesn't fit, doesn't mean you should immediately jettison it. Good ideas, beliefs that have worked reliably over time have earned the right to kind of weather the storm. So, you know, say, I don't know, say, say you hear a rumor or someone, someone emails you that says your wife is cheating on you. But, you know, you've got, you know, history, uh, you know, long and, and multivariate evidence that actually, no, your, your wife loves you and has, and has been very faithful to you all this time. And so, yeah, you're not immediately going to be filing for divorce or anything. Your initial reaction is probably going to be, well, something else is going on here. Uh, I, I'm not wrong about my wife's love and, and devotion. So, yeah, I think that's right. There's nothing you know, at all epistemically uh, wrong about what you just did there. That is the way belief works. Apart from that, if you do have to make a change, this is kind of a close cousin to uh, tenacity, is conservatism. And that says that if you have to make a change, you should probably make as little change as you need in your belief or your theory to accommodate the new information. So scientists prefer uh, small change, incremental change, to revolutionary change. Because again, if the theory has worked, then you don't want to have to give it up unless the uh, results, the anomalies are, are so overwhelming that really there is no choice. So if you can make a small change, make a small change. Yeah, if you have to make a big change, well, well do that. And when you find yourself just making arbitrary ad hoc changes left and right, then the whole thing starts to collapse on you. That's true. I don't believe in everything that philosopher science Thomas Kuhn taught, but um, one of the things he did show is that if you're going to make a change, you do probably need a rival. Another better possibility, another better option needs to come along. Even if you know your theory is in trouble, it's springing leaks left and right. You're really going to keep patching it up uh, until something better comes along. You're going to need a, you know, some other rival belief to jump to. You're not just going to say, well, this theory doesn't work anymore, and so we have, we have no idea what we believe. That really never happens. The book, again, is The Physics of Theism, God, Physics, and the Philosophy of Science by Jeffrey Kopersky. Dr. Kopersky, thank you so much for talking with us. It's been great to be here, Dale. Thank you. Today's thinking music has been Malachite by Andy G. Cohen. We got a couple of new five-star reviews in the U.S. iTunes store. One by Dustin Buller is entitled, Interesting, Intellectually Rigorous, and a Great Example of Charitable Discourse. I will begin by saying completely subjectively that this is my favorite podcast on iTunes. Perhaps the very best part about it is the example that the host, Dr. Dale Tuggy, sets for us and how to argue charitably with those who disagree with us. And this is not to say that the content is not excellent as well. Dr. Tuggy is interested in exploring theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit of Christianity and approaches this discussion from a Unitarian perspective, that there is one God and this is God the Father. However, he interviews a wide array of guests, including Unitarians, Trinitarians, and everything in between. He also dedicates episodes to the exploration of the history of Trinitarian beliefs, to interviews with philosophers of religion who have written interesting new books not related to the Trinity, and to discussions of current affairs and philosophy of religion. 
The interviews are balanced, often funny, and the aspect which I most appreciate, lean. What I mean by this is that Dr. Tuggy keeps the interviews clear and focused without meandering into rabbit trails, inside jokes, and trivialities, as other podcasts are wont to do. I cannot say enough good things about this podcast and encourage anyone who is interested in thinking deeply about God to give it a listen. Dustin, thank you very much for that very kind review. Another review is entitled, Disturb Us, Lord, to Dare More Boldly. It's a five-star review in iTunes written by a user named Would Be Knowing. They say, Dale Tuggy and his scholarly guests plumb depths of theological perception, calibrating all the while their own and others' means of measuring what are often turgid and turbid intellectual waters. Like explorer Francis Drake, Tuggy eschews arriving safely by sailing close to shore, instead navigating on wider seas, where losing sight of land we may find the stars. As from the voyage of HMS Beagle, we came to new understanding, Tuggy's Trinity's podcasts lead ineluctably to discoveries in areas heretofore mapped terra incognito. Thanks, that's a very literate and interesting review. If you'd like to leave a review in the iTunes store for your country, you can find directions on how to do this at trinities.org slash blog slash review. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider sharing on social media and even making a small monthly donation using the orange PayPal buttons on any blog post. Thanks for listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.